Well, hello. If this is your very first video, then might I introduce myself and this entire channel. My name is Eric Johnson. I'm also known as the Band-Aid Man OC over on Instagram and just about everywhere else. And I am an EMS educator. The purpose of these videos and basically of my entire channel is to supplement my classroom and my students with more in-depth information about each chapter that we go over in the emergency medical technician coursework for my program. I'm teaching primarily to individuals at the high school senior level. We get a couple that are a little older, a little bit younger, but that is my core audience. So if you are an EMT student of mine, you already know the whole spiel. But if you are new, if you're simply trying to augment your education, it's worthwhile that I explain who I am and what I do. As I said before, I'm an EMS educator and my primary job is to teach high school seniors to become EMTs. Now this is to the National Registry Standard or NREMT, but there will also be some very vague references to our local system. So you guys have a better understanding of where we are. We're located in Southern California. And my goal is to educate my students both to the National Registry Standard and to sprinkle in information about our local EMS system. You're going to hear me say this a lot, but it is important to understand that the information that you're receiving here is simply supplemental. You can't watch all 40 of these videos and my skills and then boom, you're an EMT. But it is a good way for you to review the information. Now, the book that we're using all of these slides from is the emergency care book that's published by Pearson, and the author is Daniel Limmer. There's also publication help by Dr. Michael O'Keefe and Dr. Edward T. Dickinson. So these are the resources that we're using, and specifically this is for uh, the 13th edition. So by the time that you're watching this, there will already be a 14th edition, but the information is structurally the same. So. Always make sure that you understand that this is not going to supplement your time in an actual standalone EMT class. The information is not evergreen, meaning that it will not always be uh, effective or especially as time goes on, it will not necessarily be true because in medicine, in uh, much the same way as other areas of science, it is a practice, it is something that we are constantly evolving and learning more about and at the end of the day I will not be necessarily going back to check all of these for uh, for the purposes of pro posterity so if you're watching this uh, today the date is um, June 29th 2020 so if you're watching this in 2021 or 2024 whatever the case may be the information is most likely going to be different so be sure to check in on that and then, of course, look for any updates that we do put up. But I don't want to get any further than that. Let's go ahead and jump right on in. So, as all good stories start, right here, Chapter 1, the introduction, and specifically our introduction to emergency medical care. So, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about a lot of different things, but we can break them down into four specific topics. Topic number one, the emergency medical services system, also known as the EMS system. Next, we'll be talking about the components of said EMS system, how all these systems are made up, broken down into pieces so that you can better understand how they are uh, really regulated. Next, we'll be talking about research and we'll be talking about very specific terms like quality assurance and quality improvement, uh, also known as QAQI. And then finally, we'll be ending with our uh, review on special issues as well as a very brief chapter review. Like I said before, if you're not in my class or if you haven't seen any of my videos before, they all functionally follow this same format. So you'll have the opportunity to get the most out of this by simply listening or you can watch along. There won't be any videos that are attached to these uh, individual YouTube videos. So you don't need to necessarily have eyeballs on the screen. If you're simply listening in your car, listening on your phone as you get through a workout or get through your day over at work, whatever the case may be, this serves as a podcast almost setup that is simply being delivered on YouTube. So if you're worried about seeing the video, you don't need to be able to see it to get the most out of it. If you want to take notes, I would highly recommend that you do that and also understand that the information that is being provided here is going to be at the National Registry Standard as of today, June 29th, 
2020. So things do change. But let's get into it. So the emergency medical services system. Emergency medical services or EMS really began back in the 1790s during the Napoleonic Wars. Now, Napoleon as a general, as a wartime strategist, as a historical figure is, uh, you know, rife with lots of, uh, with, with lots of different information. So we're not going to really be talking about Napoleon, but we are going to be talking about the way that EMS really began. So in the 1790s, it was found that individuals that were not killed in battle typically needed significant medical treatment. So to get them away from where the battle was occurring, horses and carriages were utilized to drive them to an area that is away from the battle so that they could be treated by, at that time, surgeons, doctors, and uh, what would eventually become nurses. This was furthered even more during the American Civil War in the late 1800s in the way that they provided care, again, off the battlefield. These were very basic systems, horse-drawn carriages or simply soldiers that were carried by other men that were on the field. We didn't have individuals that necessarily had medical training that were uh, bringing these patients away from the battlefield and over to the field hospitals, but the people that were staffing these hospitals were often volunteers that were doctors or surgeons or, as I said before, what would eventually become the nursing profession. It really took a turn for uh, for the delivery of these systems in World War I, where we started to see the, uh, the very first inkling of the Volunteer Ambulance Corps. World War I, again, was still utilizing horses and carriages, and it was still very rudimentary in the way that we were providing care, but the jump from the late 1800s, and certainly from the late 1700s, to where we were during World War I in the early 1900s, was much, much better in terms of care, in terms of uh, sterile services, and in terms of general recovery. Now, a major turn came during the uh, Korean War and Vietnam War, where helicopters, typically the Huey helicopters, were utilized to transport patients from the battlefield far, far away to a field hospital. And because they were utilizing helicopters, these patients could be far into the battle space and could be very quickly and effectively evacuated and taken to field hospital, which would eventually lead to much higher rates of survivability for injuries that in the uh, wars of the past were typically going to be fatal. Now remember, at this time, back in the United States and other parts of the world, if you had a medical emergency, if you had some type of emergency, it was more common that you were simply taken by friends and family to the hospital, or if the case wasn't nearly as severe, or if you were simply not going to be able to survive the trip, the doctors would come to you. So this is predating any of the traditional ambulance services that we see as of today. Those started to come in back in the 60s and 70s. So as I said before, we're still not seeing our atypical ambulances. We're seeing horse-drawn carriages, helicopters, and unmarked vehicles. These really started operating in the early 1900s, and they were typically run at the very least in this local area where I teach in Southern California by funeral homes, but in other parts of the countries were run by hospitals. The first fire department to really start to offer this service in a big way is the Los Angeles County Fire Department. And this, uh, this individual effort was spearheaded in conjunction with a uh, local college, University of California, Los Angeles, or UCLA, and the doctors that ran that medical center, formerly known as LA County General, now known as uh, LA County USC, or University of Southern California. So it's a general evolving process of different agencies coming in to provide these services to the individuals that call when they need to go to the hospital. Before we got into what we know EMS as today, it was a loose collection of different, you know, interested, uh, interested individual agencies that wanted to provide this service, but there was really no standard for equipment or training or even the design of these ambulances. That came further along. In 1966, the federal government of the United States decided to um, develop standards for these 
ambulance companies, and ambulance providers. The Department of Transportation, or DOT, the federal DOT, is staffed and tasked with the responsibility of continuously uh, regulating, evolving, and changing the way that ambulance support and ambulance services provided throughout the United States. Following the development of these programs at the federal level, the uh, founding of the National Registry of EMTs followed in 1970. Now, the NREMT has also evolved over time, and as we know it today, they are the very first agency that will tell you that, yes, you may refer to yourself as an EMT or emergency medical technician. They're the very first level. Now, there is something that is important to remember here. We're dealing with a lot of different agencies, so we want to understand what these agencies are, who heads them, and how they really deal with how we do our job. Because ambulances, especially in border areas where we have two states that are bordering one another, let's say California and Arizona, California and Nevada, or California and Oregon, we have ambulances that will routinely cross state lines. Because of that crossing, it is imperative and regula uh, a regulatory requirement that the federal government be involved. The example that I provide to my students in the classroom setting is that of kidnapping. Now, I don't want to make light of kidnapping, but it's important to bring up. If you kidnap someone, you deny someone the ability to leave your side and you take them over state lines, it is no longer a state crime. It is now a federal crime because you have crossed over state lines. The reason that this exists is to, at the very least, ease the burden on the states for developing standards that would uh, really only deal with ambulances or, like I said earlier, kidnappers that cross their state lines in that one area. In some states, you'll have uh, multiple areas where, in multiple states that they need to coordinate with, so it simply makes more sense for us to have a federal agency taking over those regulations. The states are still responsible for how their ambulances operate on a daily basis, but the overall federal side of things will be the set in stone bare minimum standard. So this is another important point to make. As we start to deal with federal, state, and local levels of certification, licensure, laws, protocols, procedures, so on and so forth, it is important to remember that the federal standard is usually considered the bare bones basic or the bedrock of the standards that we need to meet. So if the federal government says that every ambulance must have two EMTs in the ambulance at all times while in service, then the states cannot say we would like to only have one EMT. Now that's just an example. That is not the way that the law is set, but that is a great example of how that federal mandate works. If those states, in fact, if the state of California wanted to say, we don't want just two EMTs in an ambulance that's in service, we want three, they would be welcome to do that. That is on them. They are going higher than the federal standard, which again, is the bare bones basic version of that law or that standard. So that's a very long explanation of the difference between a federal agency and a state agency, but we will dive more into that in further chapters. Now, on the other side, we have an agency or really a group like the National Registry. The National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians, and from here on out, just because I don't want to keep saying it, the NREMT is a private group. They are not a regulatory agency in the way that the Department of Transportation or Federal DOT is. They are a group that helps keep the education standards as high as possible in a uniform manner across all the states that utilize the National Registry for education standards. So what does that mean? The NREMT is the group that says, this is the education that you need to meet at a minimum. Most states, with the exception of a few, utilize this standard to make sure that an EMT that learns how to become an EMT in Idaho can come to California with some modified training, perhaps, or an EMT from California can go out to New York 
again, with some modifications or with some additional training. They're trying to make the, the national standard as, uh, as plain as possible so that individuals can learn to that standard and depending on where they work or who they work for, that can be scaled up and uh, made more in depth if needed. The needs of an EMT working in California are not necessarily going to be the same as the EMT working in Idaho or New York or Texas or anywhere else. So we have these local standards that tell us we want you to be proficient in these things. For example, it is important that my students that are here in Southern California understand environmental exposure issues like frostbite and uh, the, the types of signs and symptoms we will see with a patient that is becoming hypothermic. However, because of where we work and live, which is uh, at the very base uh, a desert, the likelihood of us seeing a patient that is dealing with a hypothermic emergency or frostbite is very low. However, if I was teaching this course in Michigan or Wisconsin or Chicago or New York or any area that has snow on a regular basis, this would be a very pertinent lesson because every year they will most likely have to deal with patients that are dealing with some level of hypothermia. It doesn't mean that my patients here in Southern California cannot become hypothermic. What I'm trying to say is that it's less likely. Furthermore, we want to make sure that the EMTs that are being trained not only meet the state standards and the federal standards or the NREMT standards, but also the local standards. For example, my students need to go through an additional four hours of training so that they can be locally certified as well as certified at the state level because we have a larger scope of practice than what would normally be found for a EMT that's at the NREMT level. Now there's a whole lot of information there and I'll be sure to load some, uh, some links in the description below so that you can read all of this. But for the time being, it's important to remember that the Department of Transportation helps develop EMS standards and the NREMT helps develop the educational standard. Now, moving forward in our timeline, we get to 1973, where we have the National Emergency Medical Service Systems Act, or NEMSA, that's passed by Congress. This act helped create a federal standard for EMS agencies across the United States, and with rare exception, was adopted by each state to be the, again, federal standard. Now, as we look at these different standards for EMS systems, we have to understand that there are different parts. So let's break these down. Part number one, regulation and policy. This is where each state uh, takes the time to establish their law, policies, and regulations. This, again, will be, uh, will be scrutinized at the federal level, approved, and then for most states will be given to the local agencies to tweak so that it fits their needs best. Standard number two, resource management. The resource management side of these standards helps with the centralized coordination of emergency treatment and transport resources. That's a whole lot of jibber jabber that basically says we have a standard to help get emergency treatment and transport resources to one place, especially in the sense of a, of a disaster, whether it be natural or man-made, something where we can rapidly deploy, scale up, and scale down our response to the needs of the system. Move forward. Human resources and training. Human resources is an important aspect of any job, but especially with what we do and in regards to training, we are truly dealing with life and death scenarios. This isn't like working at a fast food restaurant. It's not like working in service. It's not like working in any other industry that does not deal with emergency response. We need to understand that the training and human resources aspect are there to help us respond as well as we can to something that we will be able to very easily say we have not seen before because every call is unique in some way, shape, or form. So we need to be very flexible, but we also have to have standards on how we respond to these calls, 
how we train before these calls happen, and the type of support that we provide to these EMS providers. Next, we have transportation. Because we are staffed in a way to primarily get patients from the scene of where they were uh, hurt or became ill to the hospital, we need to make sure that transportation is something that we are constantly thinking about as EMTs. As an EMT, you may not work on an ambulance. You may work on a fire engine. You may work as a park ranger. You may work as uh, some type of provider that does not transport. But for the vast majority of EMTs, they will be tasked with the safe and rapid transport of the patient to the appropriate receiving facility so that they can receive medical care. So it's important to remember, transport is our biggest job as EMTs. That is a huge con concept that most people don't think about. It's fun to drive with the lights and sirens on. It's fun to take patients that need help to the hospital. We do have very strict standards, and if I might say so myself, very high standards for how that is executed. Because of these high rigorous standards, we have a very low rate of death by uh, ambulance when we're dealing with patient care.
Next, we have public information and education. As an EMT, we are a public servant. We may not be serving in a uh, public capacity. We may not be uh, being paid by the city, state, municipality, whatever the case may be. Most of the EMTs and paramedics out in the field these days are working for a private service, but we are we are viewed by the general public as a public resource, as a public aspect of their emergency response system. In that vein, we should routinely take the opportunities, and we are mandated to take opportunities to provide public education, to educate the public about our role as EMS providers, how to effectively access EMS, and uh, ways that they can reduce their risk of injury and illness through education programs. The EMT, regardless of their affiliation or their employment, needs to think of themselves as being an outward expression of the emergency response system in the area that they serve, even if they do not respond to 911 calls. It's a common misconception that every EMT, that every, EM, uh, every EMS unit, whether it be an ambulance or a fast response vehicle or a fire engine, or even in some areas, a law enforcement vehicle, that that is paid for by taxpayer money. It's not true, but it is important and it is a good idea to treat yourself as if that is what's going on because as many of us know, public safety agencies are under an, incre an incredible amount of scrutiny for various reasons, whether it, be, um, whether it be the response or lack of response to an emergency, fiscal concerns as we enter what is uh, most likely going to be considered a recession or even a depression. Again, I'm recording this uh, at the end of June in 2020, so we really don't know where that's going to go yet, but we need to really envision ourselves as a public appendage of first response or first responders because that's how the public views us whether they're right or not and as i said before most emts and paramedics do run on the private side uh, we do benefit from that misconception because it helps the public trust us next we get medical direction now medical direction is a very difficult concept to understand at the very beginning of this course, but by the end you should feel very comfortable with the concept of medical direction. Every EMT, every paramedic, every pre-hospital provider, they are all practicing under the licensure of a medical director. That medical director, in whatever capacity that is, whether it's for their agency, their company, their county, or their state, they are saying, I have established these components of emergency response. Because I believe that this is the appropriate way to deal with these emergencies, as outlined in our pro uh, policies and protocols, I can stand behind those that have been licensed to execute on that without asking for permission every single time they go out to take a blood pressure, every time that they go out to deal with a patient that may or may not be having a life-threatening emergency. We do have the ability to reach out to these individuals. And remember, it's not going to be the same doctor every time. These doctors are uh, basically providing us with a blanket permission to operate. And then that is extended to the emergency room uh, doctors and nurses, the mobile intensive care nurses or MICN nurses that answer the radio or phone when we call, and then, of course, the individuals that are providing the care at the field level, the paramedics and EMTs. Some systems utilize a medical uh, direction, whether it be online or offline, meaning that we call for basically permission to do certain things under certain circumstances, and depending on where you work as an EMT, you may access that on a routine basis, or you may not access that at all. It may not be something that you are asked to do in your area, in your region. But again, that's where understanding your local area or your county, city, county, state, or regional uh, directives is so crucial. Moving forward.
now we're moving into the very last components that have standards set for EMS systems. Trauma systems. Trauma systems exist so that we can treat and effectively transport patients that are meet that meet the criteria for trauma care. Trauma care is something that's very difficult to explain in a very short period of time, but I think the best way to help my students and those that are watching this video understand it is that trauma is any time a patient is injured to the point where they would benefit from specialty care. These trauma centers and other specialty centers are equipped with specific pieces of equipment, whether it be in the emergency department or outside, such as uh, imaging like radiology, CT scans, MRIs, things like that, as well as specially trained staff to deal with these patients as they come in. It may not be as obvious to those outside of EMS, but those in EMS understand that not every hospital is built the same. And it's not just based off of the reviews that you see on Yelp or online. It has everything to do with the capability that they have been certified for. And these capabilities are something that, if left un unattended, may be ripped away from them. So in the area where I work and teach, we have 25 emergency rooms that have different levels of service. If you go to one of these 25 emergency rooms on your own, they will treat you to the very best of their ability. However, if you require specialty care, they will call an ambulance, whether it be a ground ambulance or possibly a helicopter for air ambulance, to transport you to the correct level of facility that can take care of you based on your specific needs. Furthermore, if you are not brought to the hospital by private vehicle or by taxi or Uber or Lyft, if you are taken to the hospital by ambulance, they can make that determination based on the education that they have received and based on the protocols that are developed at the county and city and state level to determine where you can be seen that will be most effective. A lot of it has to do with the EMT or paramedics personal judgment, but there are a lot of very, uh, very specific wor words and rules that will determine where you should go. And of course, if it just doesn't make sense on one side or the other, paramedic or EMT judgment and protocols don't suffice, we can always reach out for online medical orders to see if there is a third opinion that would say, you know what, it is best if they go to a trauma system or to a trauma center. And then finally, we have evaluation. Because in medicine, we are constantly practicing trying to become better, we have systems set to evaluate the way that we do things. We don't want to get locked into the system of, well, we've always done it this way and not change. We want to be better. We want to constantly improve the survivability of these accidents. We want to constantly strive to be the best providers that we can be. And we have very specific systems in place so that we can do that. So systems like QA, QI, and TQM. QI is quality improvement, QA is quality assurance, and TQM is total quality management. These different systems, especially in the hands of larger agencies, can help generate change that can be seen more than just in their local area. It may change the way that we provide EMS throughout the United States. And that's why we provide research opportunities and why we are such a crucial part of those research systems. So those are the 10 basic building blocks of standards for EMS systems. You won't be asked, especially as a new EMT, to do very much with these because it'll all be underlying what you're actually doing. You really only start to get into the nitty gritty, the real deep detailed aspects of these different components as a manager, a training officer, a supervisor, or somebody that is managing the EMS response for a fire department, a life safety department, a law enforcement department, or a private agency. So these are all constantly being taken into account. However, as the line EMT or the brand new field EMT, most of these will not be something that you deal with on an everyday basis out in public. These are things that you will deal with as an undercurrent to the flow of the river that you're already traveling along. All right, so that basically breaks down those standards. So let's move into the next topic, components of the EMS system. Now, 
as we look at the EMS system, we understand that it's not just two EMTs and ambulance, bing, bang, boom. They just know where everything is. We have to have folks that answer the phone and get the right level of resources out to those that require or request that assistance. These are our emergency medical dispatchers or EMDs. Then we have our EMS responders. This can be everything from the first responder or emergency medical responder, also known as EMR, moving up to the EMT or emergency medical technician, which is the course that if you're in, enrolled in my class, is the level you are trying to eventually get to. And that is where you will be if you stay in my class and pass so that you can sit for the National Registry. Beyond that, we have a different set of levels in between EMT and paramedic. Depending on where you work, you may see uh, advanced EMT and then different subsets of advanced EMTs like advanced EMT 1 and 2. You may see different levels of care like EMT cardiac in certain states where you are able to do some more advanced care than you would normally be able to do it as an EMT. And then finally, we have the penultimate first responder in the emergency medical response side of things, the paramedic. And again, paramedics can be asked to do different things depending on where they work. But that is the highest level of pre-hospital responder as our system recognizes right now. Then on the clinical side, so outside of pre-hospital, we're at the hospital, we have our emergency department and the hospital personnel. We have doctors, nurses, and other allied health personnel. And for those of you that didn't know, EMTs and paramedics can serve in the hospital on the clinical side, and they're usually referred to as emergency care technicians or ECTs, or they may be referred to as EMT or uh, paramedic with an ER designation. And then, of course, we have our specialty centers. As I said before, we have the emergency department, but we have specialty centers like centers that deal with patients that are experiencing a cardiac event. These are known more commonly as cardiac receiving centers, uh, specific hospitals that deal with patients that are experiencing neurological deficits or the uh, side effects of a stroke. And we call these stroke or neurological receiving centers. Of course, we have our trauma centers that we've talked about a little bit. And then we have other specialty centers like burn centers, pediatric centers, and so on and so forth. So these specialized care facilities, depending on where you work, may be all inclusive. And certainly where I teach and where I work, we have several trauma centers that also double as a burn center, a pediatric receiving center, cardiac and stroke receiving centers. So it's important that you understand that every single area that you may find yourself working in will have different ways to refer to these. It's not going to be anything that's super out of whack. They're not going to call a stroke center uh, something something wacky like the uh, the, the bad blood flow center. They're going to call it something like a stroke center or a neurological deficit center or something of that nature. Same thing with trauma centers. We're not going to call it the bing, bang, ouchie, elbow hurdy center. We're going to call it a trauma center. But there may be a different name that means the same thing depending on where you work. So it's an, very important to understand that you need to know what your local system says as well as what the book now, what you can see here is an atypical tra uh, trauma room. You can see that there are multiple providers. They are working with a patient that has uh, clearly been brought in by EMS professionals because you can see the patient is on a backboard. And you can see that this is more than likely going to be a patient that is going to require specialty care. You can already see that the individuals that are in this room, they are all over the patient. This is not a typical response. And you can do some basic inference to assume that this patient is in need of life-saving care based on the fact that they are on a rigid surface and it appears that they may be on supplemental oxygen or perhaps are being ventilated through a bag valve mask or BVM. But this is just an example picture of what you would find in your typical trauma room setting. So how do people access 911? They have some type of a complaint, whether it be medical or traumatic, and they or someone else calls 911. 
your EMD or emergency medical dispatcher picks up the phone and then starts to allocate resources, whether that be an ambulance with EMTs or paramedics, a fire response if that is necessary for rescue or for fire suppression, or if you're in an area like where I work, where the fire department provides the paramedics so that we have ALS response. And then they may uh, bring in other assets as well, such as law enforcement or less commonly, water and power if there was some type of involvement with power lines or water mains something of that nature and that's where you come in is the emts that are bringing the transport so now we're at the point where we transport the patient to the emergency department and the emergency department is responsible for taking over care at that point and then referring them out to allied healthcare staff or releasing them after so how do people access 911? Most of them utilize 911 by telephone. 911 is available in most communities, but as I said before, it is something that is not uncommon for rural communities to have a direct number that they would call. Typically these direct numbers aren't anything too difficult to remember, but it's not as common. 911 as a system was developed back in the 70s and it was actually uh, brought into vogue by AT&T, the telecommunications giant that we all know today. After a period where they developed it, they sold it to the federal government, and now the federal government uses that throughout the United States for individuals to access the emergency medical system or to access their local first responder agencies for whatever their needs may be, whether it be fire, law enforcement, or EMS. A more recent development is an invention or a standard known as enhanced 911, not increased 911, not emergent 911, not advanced 911, but enhanced. Enhanced 911 gives us more information about what's going on, and it can be as simple as giving us a physical location where the call is being generated from to having call history. Every single time that some, someone calls 911, especially in these systems that utilize enhanced 911, it makes a record. It says, this person has called before for this complaint. This person has had issues with first responders before. They've become violent. They are uh, someone that has mental health issues perhaps, or is uh, abusing drugs and alcohol and may be uh, uncooperative or may be difficult to uh, work with. This person may have an extensive medical history that has been documented. And now we can respond with some of the peace of mind of, we know what is happening. At the end of the day, these 911 systems are integral for us to receive the call, because as you know, we don't just drive around in, in and out of neighborhoods going, does anyone want help? Just running the siren like the ice cream man. That's not how we, how we roll. We wait for the call and then we respond. So these enhanced 911 systems are becoming more and more ubiquitous. They're becoming more common throughout the United States. However, there are still parts of the United States, and again, they're really just rural areas that don't have access to 911 at all. Moving forward, emergency medical dispatchers. EMDs will be able to, in addition to get the right resources out to the people that need help. They can also provide instructions on callers on how to provide emergency care until EMS is there. This is some of the most common aspects of the job of a dispatcher, whether they are or not EMD certified, is talking someone through the procedure of CPR or cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Many of you are very familiar with CPR. Some of you may already be certified in CPR. But at the end of the day, telling someone how to do CPR over the phone is a skill. It's a skill that requires a lot of training. And as luck would have it, to be an EMD your or emergency medical dispatcher, you can skip that training and work in the position of an EMD once you've obtained your EMT or emergency medical technician and then receive secondary training as a dispatcher. So... Some of you may be interested in working as a dispatcher as a result of completing this course successfully. Just something to think about. But the EMS system really does start at the point of contact to 911. As you can see here, we have a young woman that is working as a dispatcher and it doesn't very clearly 
note if she's an EMD or if she's working with law enforcement or a specific agency response, but you can see that she does have a lot going on. Multiple screens, multiple maps, and she's also got a headset. So more than likely, she's talking to more than one person at a time. It's a very stressful and difficult job. And frankly, our EMDs and dispatchers don't get very much recognition. So I think it's super important to remember that every time you call 911, you have someone that receives thousands of calls a day that is trying to not only take that information in, but get the right resources out on the other side. Very, very difficult job to do. Boom. As an EMT, critical decision-making is vital. We need to be able to gather information, assess our patient, determine where they're going, and by what method, whether it be ground ambulance or a helicopter, or if they're not critical at all and they're, uh, they're able to by a private vehicle, but we need to make these decisions as rapidly as we can. We also need to be able to think critically because in the absence of a rigid standard of care, like in a hospital, we have to find ways to provide excellent care in very difficult situations. Sometimes you may be asked to provide medical care to someone because they have been trapped in a vehicle and the, the vehicle itself is perhaps upside down. You may be asked to provide medical care, depending on where you work, to someone that is trapped in a suspended position on the side of a building, let's say, and you need to get access to them using some type of, uh, some type of rope and belay system. The fact of the matter is, as an EMT, you're going to be asked to work in the most stressful and extreme conditions, and you're going to be asked to be right 100% of the time, which we all know is impossible, but that is the standard that we strive for. Now, some examples of critical decisions would be the following. Is it better to take your patient to the closest hospital or to a hospital that's further away but more appropriate for the condition? Meaning, we have to take a longer route to get them to the hospital, but we're cutting out that trip from less equipped hospital to specialty hospital. Next, is your patient stable enough for further evaluation on scene or do we need to load the patient and transport immediately? This is what we will discuss in great detail, but something that we can refer to as stay in play, where we stay on scene, we spend more time doing an evaluation, we may even start some of our interventions or our treatments on scene versus load and go, where staying on scene is making the patient's condition much, much worse and lowering their chance of survival. These are for our most critical patients. So is this patient stay and play or load and go? And finally, will this treatment make the patient better or worse? And based on our understanding and our training, what are the circumstances in which we should deliver a treatment or withhold a treatment? These are known as indications and contraindications. And again, we're going to be talking about that in very, very uh, great detail further on in the class. What are the levels of EMS training in detail? First, we have our emergency medical responder. These are uh, previously known as first responders. And just so everyone's really clear, first responders is a blanket title for people that respond to emergencies outside of a hospital or other system. So these would be firefighters, law enforcement, EMTs, paramedics. These are first responders. The level that we're training at now is known as the emergency medical technician or EMT. You can see that there are some previous vestiges where they were called EMT basic or EMTI or EMT one, but now we just call them EMT. Next, we have advanced EMTs or advanced emergency medical technicians. These were previously called EMT intermediate, EMT advanced, advanced EMT, EMT advanced one, EMT advanced two, EMT intermediate one, inter EMT intermediate two. The list goes on and on, but know that there is a middle ground between EMT and paramedic. And then finally, we have our paramedic, which were uh, previously called EMT paramedic, and that is starting to come back where we're calling them EMTP. What I would like everyone to walk away from here is that we have four basic titles, and that's EMR, EMT, AEMT, and paramedic. But depending on where we work, and really depending on, on the year that you're watching this, it may be completely different. But 
some of the things here stay the same. EMT has always been, to some degree, EMT. Paramedic, to some degree, has always been paramedic. Everything else tends to fluctuate based on the times and the needs. So what may be referred to as an EMR today may be called something completely different tomorrow and so on and so forth. But understanding that the level that you're learning at is basically the entry level point where you can start doing actual work is a good place to start. Moving forward, roles and responsibilities. What do we do as EMTs? It's actually fairly simple. Personal safety. Your safety is paramount. And my students that have met me in, in person and in class already know this. Personal safety is more valuable to me and to all the other people that depend on you than the safety of your partner, the safety of bystanders, and the safety of your patient. It's a very simple concept. If I cannot help you, and you called me to help you, I've made the situation worse. And just a quick little aside, if you get hurt on a call and other first responders are asked to come and help, they are not going to help the original patient. More than likely, they're going to come and help you first. There's an unspoken bond between first responders that says, this person, whom I may or may not know, does the same job that I do, and I want this kind of care if I get hurt. You can have a lot of different opinions on this, but at the end of the day, if you get hurt or sick or anything in between or incapacitated or killed, you are delaying patient care. So by being self selfish and caring about our personal safety first, we're able to provide very selfless care. It's a difficult concept. It's something that uh, definitely starts to make more sense over time. And it certainly is not a black and white rule. Um, but at the end of the day, what I always tell my students is, I will never ask you to put your life on the line for the life of a stranger. I will always tell you that your job at the end of the day is to go home safely to your friends, your family, your spouse, your children. However, we work in an, an, an incredibly dangerous world. We work in an incredibly dangerous field. Even though I will not ask you to put your life on the line, the job does dictate that you're going to be responding to dangerous situations. So very first thing that we care about, personal safety. What do we care about next? Ah, that's when we start to care about our partner and our patient and our bystanders in that order. So personal safety, that's who you care about first. Then your partner and other people responding, then your patient, and then bystanders, people that don't need any care. After that, we have our patient assessment and patient care. These are things that we're going to go in in excruciating detail later on, but remember that patient assessment and patient care go hand in hand. We can't start providing care without doing an assessment. And as you start to learn the skills of being an EMT, you'll learn that your assessment starts the moment that the call drops. And your actual assessment of the patient, that occurs when you first get eyes on or as you approach the patient. Further down the line, we have lifting and moving. If a patient calls 911, it's not likely that they will be jumping up to jump in the back of our ambulance. There's a decent chance that we will need to move them in some way, shape, or form. And certainly, we'll need to put them on our gurney and move them in and out of the ambulance and in and out of the receiving facility as safely as possible. Transport and transfer of care are the next things that we need to worry about. Transport in and of itself is an entire chapter, and safe transport is what we always strive to provide. Transfer of care, of course, is also very important. It's never going to be acceptable for us to walk into the amb uh, to walk into the ambulance bay of the emergency department, stick the patient in a bed that's empty, and say, "All right, he's your problem now." We need to make sure that the patient care is effectively handed over in a way that doesn't leave out details while also being cognizant of the fact that we need to get things across quickly. Now you can't just walk in and say, "The, the patient's sick." That's Yes, you're right. That's fast. But that's not giving them any information. So we need to understand the fine concept of transfer of care or what we like to call it a handover report. 
And then finally, we need to remember that our primary responsibility outside of personal safety when it comes to patient care is patient advocacy. Now, what is patient advocacy? That is a huge, a, a huge sticking point. But patient advocacy is saying, my patient is not necessarily going to be able to understand or effectively get this information to the doctor and nurses. I have a very entry level and basic understanding of medicine, and I have already conducted a patient assessment and perhaps started some type of treatment. I need to make sure that I've given all of my information that I've found and been able to pull from the patient, as well as anything that I have provided to help that patient feel better so that the doctors and nurses already understand what has occurred. It is an art. Patient advocacy is, is not an art. A hand of report is art, but advocacy is not. Advocacy is as easy as summing it up this way. You should treat every patient as if they are your own brother or sister, mother or father, grandmother or grandfather. That these are people that have families too. In the absence of their presence, or even if they are present, we want to treat them with dignity, respect, and of course, we want them to receive the highest level of medical care possible based on our assessments, treatments, and transport. Moving forward. Physical traits. What are some physical traits that we look for in ENTs? First and foremost, the ability to lift and carry equipment is huge. Our equipment is not weight compliant when it comes to being the lightest piece of equipment in the world. It's not like we're setting up for a backpacking trip. We are frequently asked to take in 40, 50 pounds of equipment on top of the fact that we have 165 to 185 pound gurney, depending on where you work. With all of that, we also need to reliably able to move at least 125 pounds, at least 125 pounds. And we wanna make sure that the EMT candidate is safe and healthy in the uh, in the way that they move patients around. This is where we get into good lifting techniques. Next, we want the EMT candidate to have good eyesight. And this doesn't need to be natural. This needs to be something that can be corrected. I have known many EMTs that struggle with, uh, with vision. I certainly am one of them. But with corrective lenses, whether it be contacts, glasses, whatever the case may be, that can be fixed. I don't, however, know of any EMTs that are blind. I know one that is deaf, and I don't know any that do not have the ability to speak. So we need to be able to communicate regularly with our patients. We also need to have excellent communication skills, both oral and written. Now, everyone communicates at a different level, but as the provider going out to these 911 calls, we need to explain to our patients what's happening to the best of our understanding. And then we need to provide care that makes sense. And then we need to relay that to the doctors and nurses on the other end. So communication skills, while something that is an important trait, is something that is built over time. If you are the kind of person that is terrified of speaking in public forums, that's okay. We can work around that. If you're the kind of person that is crippled by your inability to communicate, it may not be a good fit. So we're not looking for the boisterous, I want to be a star someday person necessarily, but at the same time, we need to have the person that can leave their house and communicate on a regular basis. Some other traits that we look for, an EMT that's pleasant, sincere, cooperative, resourceful. These are all super important aspects of the EMT candidate. A pleasant EMT, just like any pleasant person, is always more fun to deal with than someone that's cranky and irritable. Sincerity is also important. We're going to be asked to respond to calls of all different levels of acuity or all different levels of severity. You'll respond to people that have a stub toe or have just had a bad dream. And no, I'm not kidding. You'll also respond to people that are in cardiac or respiratory arrest, patients that have drowned, patients that have been electrocuted or run over by a car. Sincerity is, is that trait, that affect that says, it doesn't matter what's going on. I take you seriously and I will treat you like a professional regardless of the case. Cooperative is also super important. 
We deal with a lot of high emotions on these scenes. And if we can't work with our uh, responding agencies, with our partner, or even with the patient and their family members, we are not going to provide excellent care. Next, we have to be resourceful. Because we are not in the gracious land of clinical, uh, clinical care, we're not working in a hospital, we have to make do with what we have. I'm not asking you to do crazy things. I'm not asking for you to commandeer a van and say, I'm an EMT, I have to take this, EMT business. But what I am saying is that if we find a way to do the job better in that moment with a tool that maybe is not meant for that, as long as we're not sacrificing patient care, we're good to go. So a resourceful EMT is good. But of course, resourcefulness only goes so far. If you come in with some wackadoo traction splint where their forehead's attached to their shin, the doctor and the nurse are probably not going to be super impressed. It's, that's, that's verging on the, uh, on the realm of malpractice. So it, there is a limit. As you can see here, this provider is ready to go. They're wearing eye protection and gloves. Their uniform is clean, tucked in, and ready to roll. They have their bag and they're walking with purpose. We also look for individuals that are self-starters. If you're in my class, you've already shown to be a self-starter. It's your senior year. This is not a good time for you to be taking on additional responsibilities. You want to be hanging out with your friends, doing all the senior stuff, maybe playing your last year of high school sports. But here you are in my class, whether you're in the bell schedule or after bell, you have made a conscious decision to take the next big step in your career path, whether that's becoming a firefighter, a paramedic, a law enforcement officer, a nurse, a doctor, whatever the case may be, you have goals that do not exist within the constraints or confines of your high school experience. You're taking that next step. If you're not in my class, but you're watching these videos, you are likely in that same place. You're dealing with dissatisfaction of your day-to-day -day job. You want to do something that has meaning. You want to work in a way that helps other people. But that self-starting motivation is getting into the class. Next, we need someone that's emotionally stable. Now, this one's a bit difficult, but I will breach the subject here by saying, if you are unable to see pain and suffering, that it's something that cripples you to the point of sobbing uncontrollably, this is not the right field for you. You need to be able to witness the pain and suffering of others so that we can hopefully make it better. We also look for leaders. Now, you don't need to be the type A, super aggressive, it's my way or the highway kind of person. That's not what we're looking for. Those do tend to be more in line with what we find in the field, but with every good leader has good followers. And I don't personally subscribe to the type A or type B personality. I believe that we all have aspects of both type A and type B, but if you're only able to lead or you're only able to follow, you will eventually be the worst part of a team because not every team needs a 100% leader all the time. And not every team is looking for a 100% follower. You need to be flexible. We're also looking for people that are neat and clean. I don't know about you, but if a rundown raggedy looking EMT or paramedic shows up at my house, I could be bleeding out of both my eyeballs and I'm probably gonna say, send someone else please before I collapse. And then also we need people of good moral character, good moral fiber and, and respectful of others. If you're the kind of person that's looking at the opportunity to be an EMT to steal social security cards or jewelry or loose cash, go away. I already don't like you. I don't think that's what most people really, if, uh, if anybody, that's why they get into EMS. But if you are not sure why you're doing it, but you're thinking, hey, I can get some kind of, you know, criminal enterprise going off of this. Don't do this job. Just go to prison and go away. We are routinely asked to go into people's homes. People, and, and this is not an exaggeration, they will, they will literally shove their children into your hands because they're not breathing and they know that you are there to help. We enjoy, as EMTs and paramedics, a very a very strong uh, relationship with the general public. And we don't want to lose that because of bad apples, because of bad behavior. So in addition to being of good moral fiber, good moral character and respectful of others, we're also constantly policing 
our colleagues to make sure that they are towing that line as well. I will never, ever allow one of my students to go out into the field to uh, commit morally dubious or morally wrong acts against their patients. I will remove them from my program aggressively. And I would assume that any agency out there would do the same. So if by some off chance you're, uh, I don't know, a sociopath and you just want to go out there and be a terrible person, please just go do any, literally anything else. But don't be an EMT. We also w are looking for someone that's in control of their personal habits. Now, this can be uh, this can be a pretty wide net, but basically we're looking for someone that's able to work when it's time to work and relax when it's time to relax, and they are compartmentalized. They are able to keep their work and private life separate. They are able to show up to work on time, dressed correctly, and ready to do the job. We're also looking for individuals that can control their conversations in a way that they don't become rambling manifestos, but also in a way that they're able to easily communicate with others, just like we said earlier. If we have someone that does not possess that ability, they're going to be a worthless EMT. And I don't mean that to be mean, but we have to have someone that can communicate because at the end of the day, at some point in the call, you will be the smartest person in the room. And that may sound scary, but what I'm really trying to say is that you are going to be the expert and you need to own that expert status. We also are looking for someone that can listen. Now, I'm sure that you're thinking, this dude doesn't know how to, this don't, this guy doesn't know how to, you know, uh, listen to others. All he does is talk. Well, I'm looking at a camera and I'm talking into a camera. So it's a little bit different. But when I deal with my patients, I make sure that I listen to what they have to say. The only time that I will cease listening to what they have to say is if they're being abusive or if the conversation has met its natural end. They are now repeating information. And then finally, we're looking for EMTs that are non-judgmental and fair. We will see patients of every race, creed, color, gender, sexual orientation, and every permutation in between. If you are unable to deal with them in a non-judgmental and fair manner, don't be an EMT. Go elsewhere. <laughs> but you don't have the ability to say, well, you know, I just don't like these people. The public depends on you. And because the public is comprised, at least in the United States, of, of a melting pot of different people from, from different backgrounds, we need to go and deal with them in a way that's non-judgmental and fair. And that goes even a step further. We are routinely asked to deal with individuals that have been accused or are very obviously guilty of committing a crime. They were caught in the act. They've just assaulted someone, so on and so forth. If you are incapable of withholding judgment to provide them with excellent care, you are not a good EMT. You are not a good paramedic. It's a very difficult line to, to walk. And it can be very difficult for us to knowingly provide care to someone that just murdered someone else. These cases do come up. But we need to provide them with non-judgmental care because they are deserved of having excellent care. And then, of course, we have our judicial system to deal with them elsewhere. Moving forward. Education. You must maintain up-to-date knowledge and skills. You must attend different uh, types of continuing education or CEs through refresher courses, CE courses, or conferences, seminars, and lectures. As an EMT, as a paramedic, as a first responder in general, you are a lifelong student. You will not stop learning until you retire. If that sounds horrible, this probably is not a great place for you to work. But if you think about it, every job requires that you be a lifelong learner. There are very, very few jobs out there where the job landscape has not changed in a meaningful way in, you know, 10, 15, 100 years. We're constantly finding new and better ways to do the job. And as a result, we need to keep up on our knowledge, not to mention the fact that medicine as a science is constantly evolving for the better. So we need to keep up on how those things are changing. Now, you can see here, two providers are working on an online component for continuing education. The provider on the left is working on a desktop computer 
and the provider on the right looks like they're reading through a manual. So they may be comparing their answers based off of the old manual, or they may be working through a worksheet that has an online and offline component. But again, at the end of the day, you are a forever student. You are a lifelong learner as a first responder. So where are you going to work? You could work at a private or public ambulance service. You may work for a fire department as a volunteer or as a professional firefighter. You may work in a rural or wilderness uh, team setting. You may find yourself in an urban or industrial setting, or you may be a strict volunteer. In my own experience, I've worked in many aspects of EMS, and I can say that the EMT certification is one that is ever expanding in its uh, overall application to different areas of industry. It's a very, very versatile certificate. You'd be hard pressed to tell me of another certificate where when you get it, you can work in literally hundreds of different uh, aspects of care, both inside and outside of, 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 of a normal setting. It's a very difficult cer certificate to, to match up with others because it is so versatile. And EMT is truly a stepping stone into myriad different professional applications. I've met the standard EMT track on hundreds of occasions where they started as an EMT and eventually became a paramedic and then a firefighter. And then I've seen some of the most unique applications, whether it be on the civilian side or perhaps on the military side, where they've gone on to do completely different things. EMT is a, it's an emerging form of pre-hospital provider care that is getting larger and larger every year in terms of their scope of practice and their applications as a pre-hospital provider. So how does the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians or NREMT fit in all this? It helps develop and standardize the aspects of education across the United States allows for the initial registration of EMTs, EMRs, AEMTs, and paramedics once you've completed their exams and their requirements, and may help you in reciprocity, which is that concept of going to a different area from where you originally learned. As I said earlier, an EMT from California may be able to serve in New York, but they need to go through a process known as reciprocity, where they say, yes, I've learned these things, but I want to learn how to do it your way. So they have to go through a reciprocity class. The NREMT, as it stands here in California, is a requirement for initial certification at the state and local level. So anyone that's watching this video, whether you're in my class or you're in the state of California, will need to take the NREMT to be considered and to be able to utilize the title EMT. The NREMT is utilized in different facets all over the United States, but it is the most common denominator. It is the, uh, it is the overarching agency that certifies initial EMTs off the bat. So you can go to most other states and most other parts of the country and find individuals that have gone through the NREMT process and are working under the auspices of that certification. Boom. Quality improvement. Just like we talked about earlier, QA, QI. Quality improvement is the idea of self-review that is never ending so that we can find areas of our job that require improvement. QAQI officers, QAQI departments spend their entire working day trying to find ways that we can be better. This QAQI process is something that you will be a part of whether you realize it or not by providing patient care. Every patient care report known as an e uh, PCR or electronic patient care report known as an EPCR. Every EPCR that you generate, every incident report that you write, every time that you use a tool and put it on a piece of paper, they're going to look at that and try to find out, can we use this better? Do we have a way that we can use this more effectively? Is this the best way to treat our patients? And they'll use that in both their local review and they can submit that to national agencies so that they can develop more robust systems on a national scale. 
everybody in the organization has a role and everyone in the agency that provides care or is working in the office setting, whether they be managers, billers, whatever the case may be, they have a part in quality improvement. So understanding that your role will constantly be evaluated is something that can be intimidating and encouraging at times. So remember, this is not a job where you will operate in the dark and never see your boss. This is the kind of job where you're going to be constantly asked, do you think we did this the right way? Can we do it better? And what do you think we can do to do it better? Medical direction, on the other hand, is where we have doctors and uh, especially trained nurses that can help us in the way that we provide patient care. As I said before, our ultimate responsibility is to the medical director, the doctor that sets our scope of practice. They help oversee training uh, programs, they develop treatment protocols, and they can issue both offline medical direction through our standing orders or online medical direction over the radio, cell phone, or other communication device. So what's the difference between offline medical direction and online medical direction? Offline medical direction is set way before the call even happens. We say, if a patient is breathing less than eight times per minute, we will use positive pressure ventilation through a bag valve mask or BVM to ventilate the patient artificially. An online medical order would be the doctor saying, I don't like that their, that their breaths that their respiratory rate, how often they're breathing is under 10. I want you to bag them because that would be different than our standing orders. So this is a concept that we'll be talking about on, on multiple chapters. So if it seems confusing now, don't worry, it will be clearer later. But as long as it's clear as mud that you know that there's a difference between online and offline medical direction, you're dialed in, you're good to go. So what's our role in public health? Injury prevention? Vaccination programs can be an example of public health as uh, we serve in EMS. Disease surveillance, uh, as I'm sure all of you know, coronavirus is wreaking havoc across the United States and the world. And as EMTs and EMS professionals, we find ourselves in a role of identifying individuals that are at risk and more than likely bringing them to the hospital when they become too sick to take care of themselves. We are the individuals that help with the tracking of those patients based on our EPCRs, QAQI models, and the way that we respond to certain communities. All of that feeds into the big R, research. How we do things now versus how we'll do things in the future. Research is a major part of our day-to-day -day operations. So as we're dealing with research, we follow the scientific method. The scientific method is based on uh, evidence-based processes where we form a hypothesis, review literature, evaluate said evidence, and then adopt that practice if the evidence supports it or if the evidence doesn't support it, we go back to the drawing table and we develop a new test or a new standard for research or perhaps we need more information. But research is a huge part of what we do. And that's not something that you can necessarily say you can be a line hand in in other industries. If you're working in food service, you're probably not part of the research that says, hey, these people like this food the most. All that you're doing is serving it. People aren't asking us, hey, what's the difference between these bandages? Do you think this Band-Aid is better than another Band-Aid? What we're doing is we're saying we have troves of information that we gather based on how we do our job our patient care reports, our incident reports, the way that we do things, these all come into play when it comes to research and how we can be better. Because as I said before, medicine and science, these are things that we practice. If you practice something, we try to make ourselves as close to perfect as possible. And that is where the research really comes into play. Not all research, however, is created equal. We can rely on the scientific method, but at the end of the day, because we deal with individuals that are in different situations and we're working in a very dynamic environment, we're not in a hospital, it's difficult to get information that is going to really meet that threshold of, of scientific methodology. So whereas you would have research that occurs in a lab or occurs at a college campus or a university, 
it may not be the same as the type of research and information that we pull from working out in the field. It just simply is not the same. So we need to take a couple of liberties here. We need to say we are using a very limited set of data. We are unable to uh, eliminate all the variables, so we have to take those into consideration. And we also have to take into consideration and into, uh, and, and into our study overall the fact that we're dealing with patients, um, not every day, but on a regular basis, that are dealing with a life and death situation. So we don't have the ability to say, well, this medication worked pretty well. Uh, maybe we'll give them this medication. It doesn't always work like that. So we need to be very careful about the way that we conduct EMS research. But I will say this. No one is saying, as an EMT, we expect you to do research. We're saying that as an EMT, you are actively participating in that research by simply doing your job. So how do we reduce bias? Um, perspective versus, versus retrospective. So how do we feel during the call before and directly after versus how do we feel a day, a week, a month, a year down the road? Randomization also helps us so that we don't develop a uh, we don't develop a bias that would necessarily drive us to a positive or negative conclusion. Utilizing control groups as well can help us isolate what we're looking for based on specific markers, whether it be uh, men instead of women or specific age groups. We're looking at results from a geriatric group to um, a younger. Uh, study group, whatever the case may be. And then, of course, the the similarity of these study groups. We need to look at the way that we're deriving information, who's serving on these boards, what kind of information we're pulling, and every different aspect. Where a test result may be marred by poor quality control in a lab, a test result can be marred because of a day of the week in our out of laboratory settings. It could be marred because of the weather. It could be marred because of something completely unpredictable like COVID-19. So we have to be very flexible in the way that we collect this data. And what we do our very best to try to approach it as is that we are in control of very little in the uh, pre-hospital environment. So we try to take the variables that we know we can control, such as training, equipment, availability, and documentation. So what types of research? Case studies. Well, we found that these types of patients that are seen um, at this time of day dealing with these, uh, with, with these complaints are more likely to uh, benefit from this treatment as opposed to this treatment. We found that the best way for us to uh, transport patients that need to go to a trauma center that's far away is to utilize air methods as opposed to ground methods, things like that. We also have other studies where we are going to take other information that's derived from other studies or other cohorts, where we take another department's uh, studies and we try to con we try to add those to our results. Randomized control trials, systematic review, meta analysis. These are things that you will likely never see again and will very uh, very rarely be asked to um, actually be a part of because they are just part of the overarching research that occurs from the way that we do. A great example of these types of research projects that we will be a part of would be the level of, ev the level of evidence um, designation by the American Heart Association. The American Heart Association, from here on out, I'll refer to them as the AHA, is considered to be the gold standard of cardiac care for patients regardless of where they are found, pre-hospital or hospital. Level of evidence for them is based off of different levels, level one being the lowest and level five being the highest uh, based on expert opinions. The American Heart Association will be the type of research that we are constantly playing into because CPR is constantly being reevaluated for its efficiency. Whereas in the beginning of my career, it was uh, it was common for us to do rescue breathing prior to chest compressions. We've completely flipped it on its head, and now we do chest compressions before we ever give a rescue breath. And things like that that change. That may change in the future, too. But the level of evidence and the way that they approach their studies needs to be as 
blinded as possible. And by blinded, I mean it can't be clouded by personal, subjective opinions, thought, or approach. So we try to remove the bias as much as possible. So how do we go about reading some of these research uh, models, these research findings? If we're reading a study, we're simply looking at the information. Very rarely will, be, will we be asked to be the, the individuals that approve or disapprove of what's been found. But it is important to understand where this study comes from. If you are not familiar with reading medical studies or case studies, it can be very difficult and intimidating to read at first. But your agency, regardless of where you work, should make these kinds of studies available to you on a regular basis. We want to understand the process and procedure of creating this information before we necessarily take part in it. But if we don't have that access, we're actually not doing anything wrong by simply providing an objective recording or an objective uh, in a, an objective narrative as to what happened. And that's where excellent communication skills, both written and oral, come into, uh, come into play. So moving forward, some questions to ask before you participate in research. What's the title of the study? Who are the principal investigators and primary contact? What is their hypothesis? So what are they trying to prove or disprove? Uh, what are the study's inclusion and exclusion criteria? Uh, what data is needed? How will informed consent be handled? Because, of course, we can't just take this information without informing our patients that their information will be taken into consideration. How will treatment, if treatment is involved, be randomized? And how can we effectively do that? What type of samples need to be collected? What are the benefits or the detriments to your patient? What are the uh, what are the sets of review studies that have been taken into consideration before this, uh, before this study was taken place? And what institutional review board approved the study? What medical director approved the study? And how did your EMS agency administration come about approving the study? Now, this is all considering one crucial piece of information. Have you, the provider, been informed that you'll be a part of a study? Being informed that you're being part of a study can be both beneficial and detrimental to the study itself. Because once we know we're a part of a study, we start to sometimes second guess ourselves and we certainly do perform in a way that would indicate bias. It's just human nature. It's not because we're trying to do anything wrong. It's simply because we are aware. So very often we are a part of a study that we have no idea we're a part of, a, that we are a part of simply because we are providing aggregate information by way of just doing our job. And in my opinion, that's the best way to be a part of a study is by not being able to form bias, by not being able to um, unintentionally skew the results because they're simply taking raw data, plugging it in and finding better ways to do our job. This is our very last topic, special issues, and then we'll go into a chapter review. If you're following along and you haven't taken a break yet, this is a good time for you to go ahead and uh, pause, take a breather, go use the restroom, uh, go run around and say, I'm going to be an EMT or whatever you need to do. But just know that we are in the very last stretch of our review. So be sure to uh, stretch your legs a little bit. And um, if you need to, uh, you know, come back to this video later, just make sure that you're, you know that we're on this slide here and that we are at minute 128. All right, here we go. Very last part, special issues. We're going to talk about local issues that are going to shape the education that you receive because at the end of the day, the NREMT may set the educational standard, but we are tied hand and fist to our local agency. And that's a good thing. We want to be learning at our local agency level because that's where we'll be conducting our ride-alongs or uh, our observational shifts, however you'd like to refer to them. And that is where most of us, not all of us, but most of us will be working. So we're going to be talking about these local issues as they pop up. I will encourage all of my students to tie themselves into different aspects of social media, whether it be on Reddit or on a local news app or through Facebook, Instagram, whatever the case may be, so that they can understand what's happening in the local EMS agency and in our local EMS response. It may be difficult to find off right off the bat, but if you're following someone like me that's just uh, a Denzian of the internet, I'm all over the place, I will tell you where to go. And I can tell you right now 
that being aware, being abreast of these local issues will make you a much better EMT all around. Then we have other administrative matters. So this is the basic stuff. We're going to talk about how the course is going to be done, meeting times, uh, requirements, and so on and so forth. But that's really going to be an in-class thing. So um, that that is something that you'll encounter with your own program, or if you're in mine, something that you'll already have dialed in based on uh, your your reading of my syllabus. So also, we need to make sure that uh, we, we maintain our ADA standards, um, that Americans with disabilities do have equal access to our classroom. That's all being taken care of on the back end. Uh, and if you are one of my students and you do have special needs of, of any regard, if I don't know about it, I can't help you. And usually I like to have that conversation with my students on a one-on-one -on -one basis. As a matter of fact, I will not have that conversation with you in the middle of class because it's privacy. I want to maintain your privacy. But wherever you go to school, you should have a school that's taking into consideration your need for accommodation and, and also understanding that your need for accommodation, while it should be addressed and taken care of by the providers that are providing the course, may preclude you from being an EMT because being an EMT, while we try to be as inclusive as possible, as possible requires a certain set of standards so that the job can be done. There are always exceptions. And if you're not in my class and you have a question saying, you know, I have this, I have this condition, I have this going on with me, can I be an EMT? I will absolutely answer your question as honestly as possible. Go ahead and uh, drop a comment below or uh, message me privately and I'll be happy to go over it with you. So it is time, chapter review. We're gonna run through this pretty quickly. Make sure that you read the chapter along with this and then follow through with the homework. And if you're just following along on the video, make sure that you are comparing my information to your information in your book. And this will be most likely your introductory chapter or chapter one. So EMS system has been developed to provide pre-hospital care as well as hospital emergency care. The system includes 911 or another emergency access system, dispatchers, EMTs, the personnel inside the emergency department, including physicians, nurses, physicians assistants, and other allied health professionals, as well as, to a limited degree, EMTs and paramedics. The responsibility of the EMT includes safety, and in terms of safety, personal safety above all else, followed by patient assessment and care, lifting, moving, and transporting patients, effective and uh, effective and rapid transfer of care, and of course, patient advocacy. The EMT must maintain personal and physical traits to ensure the ability to do the job that we've already discussed, like the ability to lift at least 125 pounds, the ability to have corrected vision, the ability to control your personal habits, and uh, all of those aspects. Education is a huge aspect of the job of an EMT, and as an EMT, you will be a lifelong learner. You will always be engaged in some type of learning. Quality improvement is based on good educational habits, learning all the new aspects of care, and understanding that as an EMT, as a paramedic, as a pre-hospital provider, we provide care under the direction of a medical director, which is a doctor, that helps us develop both online and offline standards of care. EMS dates all the way back to the Napoleonic Wars back in the late 1700s and was developed in all of those truly, you know, uh, horrific wars, the Civil War, World War I, Korea, World War II, Vietnam, all of those wars, and not in that order, by the way, but they they help develop EMS systems as we see them in the civilian world. And as we stand to learn from military incursions as they still continue to this day, we get even more information. And I'll give you a quick little spoiler, tourniquets. We learned a lot about tourniquets from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. So understand that EMS and the military are intrinsically tied to one another, at least here in the United States. The modern EMS system itself came from the 60s and 70s and the, uh, the, the inaction of the National Emergency Medical Service Systems Act, or NEMSA. There is a chain of human resources that are involved in EMS, and EMS is not just find patient, put patient in back of wee-woo wagon, transport to hospital, wash, rinse, repeat. It is absolutely critical that we have a well-oiled machine to make sure that our EMTs and paramedics are well provided for so that they can provide excellent care in the field. 
Finally, we, we want to just really get into the habit of understanding that personal and physical traits are going to make a successful EMT. So again, things like being able to lift at least 125 pounds is really critical. Being able to communicate both orally and in written form is critical. We also, again, want to touch on the fact that as an EMT, as a paramedic, as a first responder, you are a lifelong learner. That, uh, that learning that you're, in, that you're in right now will not end with EMT school. It's not the penultimate goal. You will always be learning because medicine changes so rapidly. So you need to understand that if school is not fun for you, you need to find a way to make it fun because you're going to be enrolled in a lot of school from here on out. And that is our very last slide. So if you are following along at home, this is the very end of the PowerPoint. It may be a bit different than what I presented in class. If you're not in my class, this is probably completely different than what you got in your class. But remember, this is the introductory chapter for the start of the EMT course. Make sure that you follow through with all of the different aspects of, uh, of, online, um, of online resources that I've put forward for you. Make sure that you're signed in for my class and for my students in all the areas that you need to be uh, signed in on. Make sure that you get that syllabus and the disclosure letter signed and be sure that you are following through with every aspect of this class. It is rigorous. It is difficult. It is not something that all of you will necessarily pass. But for those of you that are able to put in the extra effort, that are able to stick out for the rest of the uh, year-long class that we have, so from now until we finish the school year in May or June of next year, this is the very first day of the rest of your professional career. Wear that EMT student tag with pride. Make sure that you are staying up on your studies. And of course, make sure that you are keeping up with the homework, quizzes, testing, all of it. For all of the rest of you that are not in my class, thank you very much for stopping by. Be sure to check out the rest of my videos. They'll be coming out as, uh, as we go throughout the year. And there's already a large collection of videos in my vast library. So be sure to check those out. Be sure to like down below, comment if you have a question, and as always, be safe out there. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good one. Goodbye.